Nikki, I guess you'll just give me the thumbs up, will you? Yeah, um, I think we can go. Can we? Okay. Well, hello everybody. My name is Frances O'Grady. I'm the General Secretary of the TUC and it's my job to give you a really warm welcome to this webinar, which is called Challenge Amazon. Uh, the TUC has long argued for fair shares from the benefits of technology um, and frankly the news last week that Jeff Bezos looks set to become a trillionaire is reason enough. Uh, but more than that, we've also asked, argued for good business models that uh, give fair treatment, decent work uh, to workers, but also do good for the uh, community. And we've got some key priorities about fair treatment and decent work, including uh, that right, that human right to a trade union voice at work, fair taxes, uh, any good corporate citizen should be paying their whack into the pot at a time when we need uh, our public services funded more than ever. And also, tackling those bad business models. Um, you know, in many ways, Amazon can be seen as the godfather of surveillance capitalism uh, that has profound implications, not just for the shop floor, but for our democracy too. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. This webinar is being re uh, recorded. Um, there is a code of conduct uh, that's been posted in the chat box about how we conduct our discussions, but basically it's about showing respect to each other in the way that we um, discuss this. And also there will be chance, we hope, for um, a question and answer session at the end. And Nikki and Mariella are gonna be keeping a close eye on questions that you post in the chat box that you can then put to the panel. I should say that sadly, Andy, Andy Burnham, one of our speakers, um, Metro Mayor, uh, for very good reasons people will be aware of in the UK, uh, isn't able uh, to join us, but does send his best wishes and big support to the work that we're doing. Uh, but we have got an excellent lineup of speakers and they're gonna be even more excellent if they keep to that seven minute time, <laughs> time limit that, uh, the uh, TUC has set them as a challenge um, so that we can get in those questions and a bit more of a discussion at the end. And without any further ado, I just want to kick off with the wonderful Mick Ricks, who is the national organiser uh, for the GMB, who's been doing brilliant work, uh, both strategically, globally, nationally, but also critically. Uh, at the workplace door to organise Amazon workers. So straight over to you, Nick. Well, th thank you, Francis, and thank you for that uh, nice introduction. I'm really sure I don't deserve it. I, I hope in a few years' time, when GMB Union is recognised at Amazon and uh, we have a workplace agreement that we can all congratulate ourselves then, but we've still got some way to go. And I, I want to pay tribute and thanks to the TUC for its excellent report that's uh, been published today uh, on challenging Amazon on a variety uh, uh, of issues, which uh, I think are pertinent uh, and that really do need some debate and fundamentally need a lot of actions uh, as we uh, move forward. GMB over the years, we, we have reported Amazon's uh, exploitative and unsafe work practices that it's introduced into the UK are on many issues. Uh, many exploitative practices in terms of the production techniques, the pace of work uh, that people are expected to undertake. Uh, they've never been uh, scientifically uh, industrially measured by uh, proper industrial engineers. And, and it's basically working on the principle of uh, burnout and that workers are just nothing more than a commodity that can be replaced by the next worker that wants a job. 
GMB have reported on Amazon's numerous uh, union busting activities, how they get security guards to rip up our leaflets, how they search workers to confiscate those leaflets and calling cards, and how they send letters threatening us with uh, legal actions uh, 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 against our union for basically uh, giving workers the chance to organize uh, in their workplaces and to have uh, an independent uh, voice. And, and fundamentally, uh, they send us threatening legal letters just for speaking to Amazon workers out, out, outside our Amazon fulfillment centers. So, you know, there, there, there are numerous issues that uh, we face uh, in terms of the hurdles in just actually speaking to uh, Amazon workers and, and trying to organize them. Uh, Amazon uh, recently uh, have been caught out on surveilling uh, trade unionists and uh, Amazon workers. There's a, a list of sites that Amazon have uh, obtained entry into, uh, which were for Amazon flex drivers uh, in the UK and also in the, in the US. Uh, Amazon actually obtained entry into these sites by either the use of uh, uh, technology that it's developed because uh, a number of these sites are private sites and they're actually used by couriers themselves to speak to, to one another. And, and so there's uh, a number of issues now uh, what's come to the fore about Amazon's uh, uh, behaviour and its behaviour towards uh, trade unions. We've reported on the numerous cases of ambulances uh, visiting Amazon sites here in the UK. Over 600 ambulances in a three-year period, which was far more ambulances uh, uh, visiting sites than most other employers uh, 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 within the transport and logistics sector uh, in the UK. One particular site had 115 ambulance visits uh, uh, in that particular period, ranging from uh, issues of injuries to, uh, to people that were quite serious through explosions uh, within the fulfillment centers, people suffering strokes, breathlessness, uh, broken limbs, and pregnant women having miscarriages uh, here in the workplace. So it's quite a, a truly a phenomenal uh, a, a range of issues that's taking place there. Many commentators that have gone undercover and worked in Amazon sites have also reported on uh, people uh, peeing in bottles because they don't get enough breaks because of the pace of work and the productivity that they're, 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 they're having uh, uh, to take. And you know, Amazon in the UK is spending literally millions of pounds on, on fluffy TV adverts saying what a great safe place it is to work rather than actually spending the money on making the workplace safe. That's, that's the irony that uh, uh, we, we see uh, uh, that takes place. And, you know, uh, when you look at the, uh, the millions that Amazon, through its, uh, its tech services, is now receiving in government contracts and other public sector contracts, you know, uh, it is time for this call to be made that actually the government and other public sector organizations in the UK can actually use leverage on those contracts to actually say it is time that there is a, a proper recognition of workplace safety. It's time there is a proper recognition for, for a union voice within these workplaces so that we can, uh, we can work together and ensure that uh, safety is at the forefront of people's work. You know, it's not nice when workers are sometimes expecting that through the course of their, day, of their day, they may end up going on in an ambulance. Now, now nobody should have that fear uh, of going to work. Nobody should have the fear of also contracting COVID. One of the things that uh, is rightly being mentioned 
is Amazon's woeful record on its response to COVID. If, if it wasn't for uh, my union at the outbreak of COVID, threatening to actually uh, challenge Amazon with the safety authorities in, in the UK because of uh, a number of measures that it wasn't prepared, prepared to put in place, like social distancing, no hand sanitizer being provided, no PPE being provided, then we had no alternative but to actually go to the safety authorities. They only took up uh, and, and took that notice seriously because of a actions that were taking place in France that had closed down their fulfillment centres by, by legal action, and also a GMB union threatened to take them uh, uh, to, uh, to the safety authorities in the UK. And today I am still receiving reports of Amazon's woeful reaction to COVID as it's now taking on board thousands more workers uh, into the peak production for Prime Day, for, uh, for the upcoming Black Friday events and for the Christmas peak. You know, uh, workers have been asking, why will Amazon not put the QR codes up on the entrance to, to Amazon sites so that track and trace can be used? And Amazon is saying, well, we've got our own track and trace system, which lo and behold is viewing people through the CCTV cameras. You know, very woeful, very shoddy reactions. And they've even now said they will not provide support to workers that catch COVID and have to self-isolate. And COVID rates are going up daily in the UK, not just in wider society, but now in Amazon sites, uh, which we've got many, many reports on. So there's lots of things that are taking place. It's right that we're challenging Amazon's behavior. You know, we as a union, we believe in good work. We believe that Amazon correctly using its technology could be a force for good if it decided that it was not just about making a few individuals at the top of the company very, very wealthy. It could be a force for good. And it's only by actions like this, events like this, that will force Amazon to the bargaining table to give workers a proper voice to ensure that a union is recognised and to ensure that workers, when they go to work, go home safely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. Join a union, I think, is the message there to uh, any worker, but especially any worker from Amazon who's listening. Um, thanks very much. Our next speaker is Stacy Mitchell. Stacy is the co-director of the US-based Institute for Local Self-Reliance. It's a national research and advocacy organization. Now, we've already heard about how many public sector contracts in the UK Amazon has been scooping up under this government. Um, and I think uh, Stacey is particularly aware of just how significant a presence uh, Amazon has become in the public sector in the United States, the risk that that poses, and hopefully will give us some insights into what we can do here in the UK uh, to check and to challenge them. Over to you, Stacey. Thank you so much. Uh, it's really terrific to be with you all this morning. And I also wanna just commend to UC on this really important report uh, and also helping to lead uh, a growing uh, international movement to challenge Amazon's outsized power. Um, you know, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, we're a research and advocacy organization, and we work uh, broadly to counter concentrated economic power and to build thriving, uh, equitable communities. And a bunch of years ago, six or seven years ago, we really started pushing hard for people to take a closer look at Amazon's reach and impact. And we've subsequently published a number of in-depth reports. Uh, one of our earliest was a, a report called Amazon Stranglehold that looks at Amazon's monopoly power, its impact on small businesses, workers, and local communities. Um, two years ago, we published Amazon's Next Frontier, which is a look at Amazon's push into public sector procurement and the consequences and uh, problematic nature of what it's doing in that area. And most recently, we did a report called Amazon's uh, Monopoly Toll Booth, which came out in July and looks at how Amazon 
increasingly controls uh, the infrastructure uh, uh, for commerce and uses that control to, in effect, levy a tax on the trade of its competitors and what the implications mm -hmm. of that are. Um, in addition to doing a lot of, of the research, we've also co-founded Athena, which is a coalition of more than 50 organizations representing working people, small business people, neighbors, and others fighting to break up and regulate Amazon uh, and to build a more democratic and, and equitable future. And that coalition launched publicly about a year ago um, and uh, has been really building out uh, and becoming uh, more and more of a force in both organizing and policy work across the US. Um, you know, one of the things I think is, is can be helpful, you know, Amazon is so massive and reaches into so many different industries that it can be really hard to, to get our minds around what Amazon is exactly. I mean, this is a, this is a company that produces hit television shows, um, yeah. dispenses prescription drugs, um, you know, I mean, it is a massive player. In so, you know, all of these various things, what exactly is this entity at, it, at its heart? And I, I think the most helpful way to think about it is that this is a, is a company that wants to control essential infrastructure. Um, so Amazon in the US accounts for more than 50% of online shopping and online shopping search. Um, more than 60% 60, 60 of shoppers now start their um, shop, uh, shopping online right at Amazon instead of at a, at a search engine. They also control about half of the world's public cloud computing capacity. They're building out a logistics and package delivery operation in the US that now rivals um, uh, major players like UPS and indeed even the US Postal Service and the number of packages that it's delivering to customers. Um, and Amazon's voice interface, Alexa, is uh, the dominant uh, of the voice interfaces and means that it, it is the you know, sort of operating system for this new world of voice, the intermediary between us and all of the uh, devices and services that we want to access online. So you know, in other words, Amazon increasingly controls the basic infrastructure that other companies and we as users need in order to access uh, information and exchange goods uh, in the modern economy. And that gives Amazon an incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly powerful position to be in. Uh, Amazon has an extraordinary view into what all of these other companies are doing on its cloud, on, uh, online shopping and so on, the ability to really surveil and monitor and gather data, which Amazon then can use to entrench its own power and to move into to other industries with a built-in advantage that no one else has by virtue of being able to see what market players are doing in those sectors. And it gives Amazon the ability to set the terms by which other companies can engage. Um, you know, this summer in the, in the report that I mentioned earlier, we found that Amazon uh, is now charging about 30%, taking about a 30% cut of the sales made by third party sellers on its website. That's up from 19% just five years ago. Uh, and indeed, in, in documents released by, the, by Congress last week, we learned that Amazon internally has been noting to itself that, uh, by the way, we keep raising these fees and we aren't actually losing sellers for the reason that we are effectively a monopoly. There is no other place to go. We can charge as much as, as we want. Um, so, you know, one of the, the areas that has been really an under the radar is Amazon has been taking all of this, this market power. One of the areas that has been really under the radar is its moves into public sector procurement. Um, here in the U.S., Amazon has become has signed has signed a national contract to supply um, hundreds of thousands uh, of local governments across thousands of local governments across the country, city councils, school boards. Um, they're signing a growing number of deals with state governments, and they also have a lot of federal uh, contracts as well. And you know these are partly uh, for the cloud, but also for um, supplies. Um, so you know school districts buying school supplies, office supplies that city governments need, all kinds of, of, of different goods that they purchase. And what we found in our reporting on this is that these uh, uh, contracts that Amazon uh, is signing pose several significant risks. One is that they don't protect taxpayers. They actually lack many of the provisions that ensure that people are getting a fair deal. 
um, and, uh, and, and really expose public dollars to being taken advantage of. Uh, second, they're allowing uh, parts of, of government procurement that should be run, a uh, decision-making process that should be run publicly to effectively become privatized, where Amazon is now effectively running government procurement. Um, and finally, uh, Amazon is using these contracts as a tool of its monopoly ambitions because it's going to local governments and saying, oh, you can, you can still do business with the local companies that you've long been buying office supplies and, and other kinds of supplies from. But those companies now just need to get on our platform and sell through our uh, interface. We're gonna take a cut, of course, for doing that. Um, so it is a way of corralling ever more uh, businesses onto its website uh, and thereby having control over, over their trade. So what do we do? Um, one, you know, we, we think it's really important to build a, a, a coalition as we are working to do that, that spans small businesses and working people, that unions and small businesses really need to be allied in this fight. Two, we need to resurrect our anti-monopoly policies that part of the issue here isn't just Amazon's behavior, but the fact that Amazon has this much power in the first place and we need to attack that root problem directly. And three, we really very much as this report that you've just published is helping to do, we need to really engage local governments in a not, you know, in saying you can no longer support this kind of company. You cannot hand over your procurement. You cannot subsidize them and help them develop um, because this is ultimately undermining uh, democracy and undermining the well-being of, of, the, of the local economies on which your revenue depends. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, really food for thought there. Uh, our next speaker is Tim Bray. Uh, Tim is a former, emphasis on former, vice president at Amazon. Uh, he resigned over the sacking of workers who had raised the alarm during the COVID-19 crisis. So a really big warm welcome to you, Tim. Over to you. Oh, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for having me. And uh, hello from the southwest corner of Canada, where it's 7.30 in the morning. So if I don't make any sense, <laughs> that's why. Um, so I, I read the TOC report, which was, was super interesting, and I wanted to start at the end of the report where I find a list of the things that Amazon should do. So it says Amazon should allow workers to meet and organize effectively, but you know Amazon won't. Amazon should allow unions access. You're not going to. Amazon should ensure its workforce, employees, or contractors are being paid at least the real living wage. No, they won't do that. Amazon should provide secure work. No, nope, not going to happen. Amazon should follow all health and safety laws. Well, yeah, they might do that. Um, Amazon should recognize and work with unions. Amazon should consult recognized trade unions. No. Nope. Amazon should pay their fair share of tax. No, nope, they won't do that. And then the final line of the report says, if Amazon won't do better, then unions and governments at all levels must work together to make sure that they do. Well, spoiler alert, they won't. So here's <laughs> another problem that I think echoes what, what Mick said that doesn't really feature in your report, but I wanted to put it on the table. In the US, an organization called the Center for Investigative Reporting recently published a report a couple of weeks ago that appeared on the front page of the Seattle Times entitled, entitled How Amazon Hit Its Safety Crisis. So here's the shocking news. If you measure the injury rate in Amazon warehouses, in many US jurisdictions, it's twice as high as the industry standard and getting worse. Um, I don't know if those measurements have been done in the UK, but I assume they would be similar. It's not because the work in the warehouses is, in, is intrinsically dangerous. It's that Amazon has focused so relentlessly on efficiency that the flow of work never stops, even for a moment. In recent years, some of the warehouses have had robots added. This will be wonderful for the workers, they said, because they won't be running around all the time to shelves and to packing stations. They just stand there and everything comes to them. So it turns out that the injury rate went up dramatically because the chances to pause and breathe just went away. The human body, particularly if you're not young and athletic, is simply not designed to work that way. Plus, thus those injury rates. So to the list above, I think you might consider adding, uh, Amazon should publish injury rates to ensure that the warehouses are a safe place to work. And like all the other things in that list, no, they're not gonna do that. Now, let me make this personal. Uh, 
as you may have heard, on May 1st, I left Amazon because I found the practice of firing activists speaking up uh, about workers who are worried about uh, COVID to be unacceptable. The actual sequence of events was amusing. It turns out that before I became infamous uh, for leaving Amazon, I was already what you might call geek famous. Go and talk to your IT people and ask them if they've heard of Bray, and they might have. And so I had decided to publish a blog about why I was quitting in the hopes that it would get featured on a few of the geek websites like Reddit and, and Hacker News. So I was up uh, slaving away over my server till two in the morning the night I quit, uh, or actually the Sunday morning, Sunday evening after I quit uh, to make sure everything was optimized and running, running fast. So because, um, you know, when they get picked up on those geek sites, you can get quite a bit of traffic. So anyhow, then I hit publish and went to bed. Now, I'd forgotten that since I was now an unemployed bum, I didn't need an alarm. And my alarm went off at 630 in the morning. And I was going to just turn it off and go back to sleep. And I thought, oh, I wonder if anybody noticed. Oh, my God. So that blog piece got 620,000 reads. And there was a story in every news publication in the Western world. Now, the fact that this was considered newsworthy is interesting. But it gets more interesting. Shortly thereafter, I got literally thousands and thousands and thousands of responses on every available input channel, uh, Twitter, email, um, uh, blog comments, LinkedIn. And the interesting thing is that 99.9% .9 of those uh, comments were positive and supportive. It was really heartwarming. So why am I telling you this story? It's because I think that the problem we're facing, that you're facing, is really at the core a political problem. Obviously, the labor relations issues are at the core, but I think the interesting solutions are political. And I think there's good news. As recently as 10 years ago, technologists and the big tech companies were popular. I was there. We were seen as a team of brave young people bringing innovation to the people. Our leaders were sort of hero worshiped. Now the pendulum has swung. You know, years of stories about worker abuse and privacy abuse and, uh, and gig economy abuse and monopoly behavior abuse and tax abuse have changed a lot of people's minds. And the flurry around my departure is just more evidence of that. So I think the political tides are actually flowing in your favor. I think the iron is hot and it's, it's really time to strike. And here's a couple more reasons why I think political action is the way to go. So Amazon isn't uniquely evil. It's just bigger and more efficient and touches more people's lives. What it's doing is exactly what they teach every aspiring commerce student working on their MBA in business to do. The problem is that the equations they use to measure efficiency leave out the life experience of the people on the front line doing the work. And the reason for that is that those people don't have any power. Being customer obsessed is okay and being efficient is okay, but the, what's happening in the warehouses just isn't okay. And Amazon itself isn't really the problem. Amazon is just a symptom of a much bigger problem, which is the shocking imbalance of wealth and power in 21st century capitalism. If we don't like what Amazon is doing, or any other big company, and we don't, the answer is to introduce regulation and le legislation that cuts across the board to improve the power and position of working people so that the behaviors we see now are no longer acceptable at any big company. And in the UK and the developed world, we still are largely governed by laws rather than individuals. And thus, you know, the law is the way to attack it. So I think the political action we need is mostly national political action. I read the sections of the TUC report on what's going on with local operations and their deals with local governments. And to be honest, I'm kind of pessimistic about the ability of local governments to deal with the Amazon. With Amazon. You know, it's, it's a big, rich company. They're going to have more expensive lawyers and more of them and have done dozens of these deals. And whereas the local government, it's, it's a new experience in each time. National governments have the sophistication and scale uh, to set the ground rules and simply a rule abusive deals out of bounds. So politics isn't fun. Politics is greasy and grimy and boring. It's two steps forward and one step back. It's compromise after compromise, but I think it's at the essential core of the way forward here. And I think the thing that's going to make it work is the groundswell of popular support for working people and against big companies in general and big technology companies in particular and Amazon in particular, particular. So the UK and America are behind 
the folks over in France and Germany, as we saw in the uh, as play out in the first wave of the of the COVID news. Um, that's sad, but I think it also provides a well worked out example of the improved results we can expect to get in the UK and America if we work hard and introduce better labor laws and legislation. So it's not as though we have to invent that much new stuff. It, you know, the, the best practices are well known and well understood. Obviously, you have to keep your organizing skills sharp and your message to workers polished and be poised and ready the moment that governments open up a bit of room to get in there and organize fast and, and get some good, good union, union deals for those people. You know, but I don't think we're really going to see material progress until the workers are empowered, empowered by unions, but at least as important, empowered by legislation and regulation so that they have to be treated as humans and citizens, not merely as replaceable units of work. So best of luck to you. And uh, I think the way forward is actually reasonably straightforward, not easy, but reasonably straightforward and time to get going. You're muted, Francis. That was a really stimulating contribution. Thank you. And um, I think for sure, we're all very clear workers are not just commodities. Uh, we're human beings, but we're trade unionists, but we're active citizens too. So that kind of political dimension of the fight, I think uh, we get. Our next speaker is Michelle Meager. She's the Senior Policy Fellow at the Centre for Law, Economics and Society at UCL. And she's been working on legal policy, uh, focusing on public interest, market regulation and corporate responsibility. And she's going to uh, give us her contribution looking at how all that fits with Amazon. So thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Francis. It's fantastic to be here and um, congratulations to, to UC on publishing such a fantastic report. Um, I should give a bit more context as to my kind of expertise here. I'm coming here as a competition lawyer. Um, I'm a founder of an organization called the Inclusive Competition Forum, and I recently published a book called Competition is Killing Us, which is all about corporate power and how we need to uh, tackle it and take account of it. So I'm in the happy position of um, being able to kind of agree and, and support the, the previous statements that were made. Uh, we have such a fantastic group of experts uh, here on the panel. So I'm gonna focus on my area of expertise. So that's the competition and um, anti-monopoly aspects. So I absolutely agree with um, Tim's point there that we need to be talking about politics and we need to be talking about national laws and legislation. And the specific legislation that I'm gonna be talking about is competition law. The context I think is important here. Um, we've had decades now of this law, competition law being weakened um, across, the, across the world really, but definitely in the US and in Europe and in the UK um, where we might have seen some, some particular action or traction. What does that mean? It means that authorities have not been challenging corporate power. They have not been challenging monopolies. They have not been blocking mergers where they might have the opportunity to, and they have not been targeting illegal unfair um, competition conduct. And the result is exactly what we can see, companies like Amazon um, able to act with impunity. What the authorities have very recently do, been doing, and that ties into the kind of uh, China, the oh, sorry, <laughs> the changing of, of views and the, um, the possibility and political moment that we have now, is so we have authorities investigating their own past practice and looking to see, you know, why is it that we've essentially been focusing on competition and yet allowing companies like Amazon to exist. And what these investigations have found is egg on the face of authorities all around the world, that they allowed Facebook and um, WhatsApp to merge, that they allowed Facebook to buy Amazon, that they allowed Google to buy various um, uh, parties, the uh, Amazon and uh, Whole Foods merger is an example of that. The TUC port report is so important in that context because myself and people like Stacey and, and others around the world are trying to build these anti-monopoly movements, which really bring together all of these different strands. We need to be presenting a full picture here. The types of conduct that the TUC has raised in its report, you could take that in so many different 
sectors and contexts and see the same tactics and the same conduct um, taking place. And it's fantastic to have those that evidence. And particularly in the UK, we have very few reports that are UK focused. So I'd like to see more of that as we're trying to really build a narrative of why anti-monopoly is such a strong cause and where the different strands are that could tie into that. So um, as some of you may know, um, Congress recently, the US Congress recently re released a report that looked into all of the, the big tech giants and really created a really detailed um, ledger of all of the uh, harms and all of the conduct that these, com these companies have engaged in. And we saw these common tactics across Facebook and across Amazon and Google mm -hmm. and the common mechanisms that they've used to entrench their power. But when people ask me which company I'm most concerned about, I always say Amazon. And the reason is because its impacts in the real world can be felt immediately. And they're felt by so many different people and in so many different contexts. Clearly, surveillance is a huge issue when you're talking about Facebook and Google and the impact on democracy. But we also see uh, surveillance in the Amazon warehouses, and we also see it in our homes via the Alexa voice interface. So these are hugely concerning trends. And we doubly see the impact of the high street and the deterioration of the high street that's caused by the um, competition with Amazon. So we need to be looking at how they've been able to manage to get to that position. I also think it's a really, Amazon presents a really good example, um, the best example perhaps of our obsession with this low price, low wage spiral, which is essentially this kind of myth that we're served by low prices as consumers and therefore it which kind of compensates somehow for the low wages and poor working conditions that workers then have to face. It's used to justify their power. From the Congress um, report that I mentioned earlier, one of my favorite sections is where it talks about um, CRAP, which is C-R-A-P. These are products that Amazon um, designates as C-R-A-P, cannot realize any profit. These are products that Amazon decides are vital for it building its um, market share. These are low priced, heavy goods that are that are unprofitable to ship. So they price them low and undercut their competitors, including those who are selling on their own marketplace. And then once they've secured their um, customers in that sec segment, they put up the prices, which is called crapping out. Now, I mean, this is like, it sounds kind of a facetious example, but I suppose it shows this is how they talk about it internally. Um, this is the kind of way that Amazon sees its, its com competition and its competitive advantage, that they are able to have that information to see what all of its competitors are pricing because they're pricing on their own marketplace and they're able to then price accordingly in order to gain market share. So I think what that really does is challenges this myth that we have Jeff Bezos, you know, starting a company from his garage where he was able to build this amazing service that everybody loves and he's providing us with something that we wouldn't have otherwise. They've not done that through fair competition. As your report shows, they've done it through tax avoidance, they've done it through surveillance, through unfair competition, through pre self-preferencing, which is preferring their own products on their marketplace, and by leveraging power over national and local governments. And that power multiplies. And meanwhile, the power is drained from the other sections of the economy and from society. It's drained from local communities, it's drained from unions, it's drained from working people across all different segments. And I think what the kind of key point here to bear in mind when we mentioned various things around corporate responsibility and the power of business to do good, whenever we're talking about corporate responsibility, we must tie it together with the issue of corporate power until we have a handle on corporate power and challenge corporate power, businesses won't do any good. Exactly as Tim says, they, you know, they'll take the list of things that we think business should do and they just won't do any of them. Which means that if we're talking about corporate power, then competition law must kick in. Your report talks about um, the digital markets regulator and the regime that is being discussed in the UK um, for regulating companies like Amazon. But, we, well, but it doesn't talk about, which I think it should, should really um, surface, is that a voluntary code of conduct amongst these companies really isn't going to cut it. We need to have much stronger antitrust enforcement. And that includes potentially breaking up companies 
which is a line of business separation, which has been discussed in the US as well. That would mean you separate um, AWS and the cloud services. You, se you separate that from the warehouse. You separate that from the marketplace. You separate that from their um, private label uh, production the, of the Amazon basics. And then you prevent the ability for them to leverage across all of those different points. Separate to that, so that's kind of one category, which is kind of tackling um, their corporate power. The other piece is the countervailing power that's provided in the rest of the economy and through unions and so on. We need to be looking at how do we shore up that power? One uh, piece of that is that competition law needs to get out of the way, make sure that independent contractors can actually cooperate and collectively bargain. Um, the delivery riders have had a case where they've been trying to kind of get their union recognized. We need to have laws that actually support that kind of thing. And then we should also look at other ways of increasing the voice of workers. So employees on boards is another mechanism. A lot of these things, we think about them in their kind of more dated context. And we think about, you know, what, what was um, this power used for in the past? We need to think about it in the context of this diverse, just really kind of diffuse power that we have through companies like Amazon, where the only way that we're going to ever be able to challenge them and take control of that political moment is if we have a movement of uh, people who are really telling the entire story of how these companies in, impact our lives. So that, that's my kind of brief contribution, but I think there's a, there's a lot to be said there around how we need to tie together this, these issues of corporate responsibility and corporate power. Fantastic, Michelle, thank you very much indeed. Um, and last but not least, we've got uh, Christy Hoffman, who is the General Secretary of Uni Global. Uh, this has to be it's another part of that multi-pronged approach uh, that Michelle was talking about. This has to be a global campaign, not just a national and local campaign. Uh, so over to you, Christy. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, thank you for the invitation to join this very distinguished panel today. And thank you for the TUC for sponsoring this timely event. And, you know, why do I say timely? Um, you know, just last week, it was announced that Jeff Bezos's wealth had increased to $200 billion, which means he could pay every one of his 875,000 employees an amount of $105,000 and still have the same wealth that he had back in February of 2020. That is an astounding, uh, that's astounding math problem, I would say. Also timely because just last week, a committee of the US Congress called for dramatic measures to break up and regulate Amazon and the other tech giants, which is a real turning point for this industry. Um, and third, timely, because um, our affiliate Verity of one of the biggest unions in the world is going to strike seven warehouses tomorrow for a collective bargaining agreement in, in Germany. Well, Amazon is almost always timely in 2020. Um, I, I hope, um, as the last speaker today, I hope to make a few points without repeating what everyone else has said, but I know that there are so many things on which we, you know, we all agree. Um, and, and first, let me recognize the very comprehensive report and welcome report produced by the TUC, which makes a great contribution to our Amazon discussion and strategies. Um, as your report points out, Amazon has only grown stronger during, during the COVID pandemic. Um, this crisis is radically reshaping our world, and one of its unfortunate side effects is the acceleration of Amazon's domination of our markets and many aspects of our lives, how we work, how we consume entertainment and communicate. But just to look at the figure in terms of its e-commerce, in the second quarter of 2020, the sales were 40% higher year on year, and its stock price was then and is still soaring. Now, I represent commerce, Uni represents commerce workers across the world. We know that the expansion of e-commerce um, during COVID is never going to go back to pre-COVID levels. Um, and this growth in e-commerce has had an incredible impact on the commerce sector. Um, and when we think about, you know, the employers always say to us, 
well, we need to have a level playing field. Um, well, Amazon operates and intends to operate at a loss in Europe. It loses money. Is that fair for the brick and mortar stores which occupy our cities and towns and what you would say in the UK are high street? No, of course not. Is that a, lay, a level playing field? Uh, is that a playing field that e we even want to occupy, let alone level? And of course, no, it's not good our, for our communities. It's not good for our workers. Amazon has an unfair advantage, doesn't pay taxes, um, is, is one of them. Um, now, we already know, you know, we've heard Mick talk about, and also Tim a little bit, that the incredibly grueling pace of work in the Amazon warehouses. And I think we have to recognize that the growth of Amazon during the pandemic came off the backs of workers in many respects. The grueling working conditions, unrealistic productivity targets, surveillance, and a refusal to recognize or engage with unions unless absolutely forced. Um, now we saw this in similar problems in the US, in France, in Italy, in Spain, in Germany, the pace of work when the, the volume exploded, um, but there was no reduction in the pace of work for workers, it became impossible to operate safely. It was impossible to have social distancing. And only through strikes, collective action, legal intervention were workers able to secure progress. That mostly happened in Europe. We saw a big steps forward in Spain, Italy, and uh, France, but elsewhere, you know, workers were fired for speaking out. Now, I think as your report points out, governments need to be on the side of workers and force Amazon to improve working conditions and respect unions. Um, because not only does Amazon use its market power to avoid taxes and squeeze small businesses and engage in price dumping, it also drags down labor conditions and that's, and that's clear. And the report that, that Tim was referring to published, I think by a group reveal, it's incredibly powerful um, uh, statistics about the impact of robots on the safety and health of workers. And I must say, I, I always, I, I, I was shocked by it. And I've seen a lot of bad reports. Uh, I was really, really shocked by it. Now, what another thing that we've been shocked by is the policy of surveillance. Um, and the recent revelation about Amazon's attempts to spy on workers, its decision to hire intelligence agents to report on risky activity, which includes terrorists and trade unions in the same sentence. That was shocking to everyone, especially in Europe. Um, and last week, our um, regional office, Uni Europa, helped organize top union leaders um, from around Europe to call for an investigation at the European Commission. And I was su surprised, I must say, we were proud and surprised to see this story got global coverage from mainstream media. It was even covered in China. Um, so very, very shocking. We're encouraged that a cross-party coalition of 37 MEPs echoed our call in a letter to Bezos last week that also got attention. Now, I want to say, I know the UK wants to have a trade agreement with the United States, but one import that you do not want is classic US style union busting, uh, in which the US is the world's ex expert and leading exporter and Amazon is top of the class. So, um, but the surveillance is just one more, one more big piece of evidence and, um, and they have more, uh, more than that um, if left to their own devices. Now, I just a comment on the um, research about Amazon as a purchasing agent, um, you know, government procurement in the UK. St Stacy has done a great job of really analyzing that problem, that widespread practice spread practice in the United States. At uni, you know, our plan is to go deeper on this topic across Europe and across the world so that we can have more clarity about the extent to which Amazon has reached into our public sphere. Um, but really, the issue raises some very important questions. How much control are we willing to hand over to Amazon 
in the running of our democracies? Are they going to host all of our data? Will they be the entity through which governments interact with local business? Uh, we don't want that. We can't hand the keys of our democracy over to Amazon and Jeff Bezos. And I especially want to welcome the part of the report that talks about using purchasing power of local governments to demand ethical conduct, including the right to organize. This is a big topic across a lot of countries of Europe right now and has also been a big topic in the United States. I mean, I agree with Tim that procurement policy should optimally be national, but if we can't move it nationally, I think it's the right thing to put on the table with local governments. And it's a great addition to the set of tools that we can use to influence our future with Amazon. So just on a few next steps, you know, at uni, we're very proud to support your fight in the UK and elsewhere across the world to deliver justice for workers. Our Amazon Global Alliance has been around for almost six years now. We are happy to include unions from every continent. We've been working with GMB and other unions around the world to raise the profile of Amazon in our societies, to show solidarity with one another, to develop joint strategies. We're gonna to continue to do that because the labor movement knows how to come together to confront global anti-union corporations like Amazon. But I, I, Amazon is too big a problem for any of us to solve alone. We, we also believe that we must come together with our civil society allies, because in terms of monopoly, worker rights, tax avoidance, surveillance capitalism, um, climate change, Amazon has to change. Um, so along with the ITUC, UNI took the first step last year when we brought together prominent Amazon critics from across a range of issues in the first ever Brussels Symposium. Uh, we'll do something later this year, um, primarily aimed at, at EU uh, on anti-monopoly policy. Um, and we are gonna to continue to work with um, a range of allies because when we come together in our unions and in our communities and with our elected officials, we can be more powerful than we can imagine. And this year, we are gonna take action together on Black Friday on November 27th, where uni and a coalition of organizations will come together uh, to make Amazon pay. So we ask all of you to join us on Black Friday and together we will win. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, now, I hope that people have been putting their questions in the chat box. There's still time to do that. And if you want to direct them at a particular panelist, please do just say. And Nikki, who by the way, deserves credit as the author uh, of this report, uh, together with Mariella, uh, uh, I know have been looking at questions and I wonder whether you both want to uh, direct some of them at the panel for us. Sure, thanks Francis. Um, we've had a couple for Mick, um, really around compliance, asking about is it that we need new laws to protect workers or if we have tougher laws, what can actually be done to force Amazon's compliance? Um, and the second one around the GMB's work, whether they've been able to trigger health and safety inspections in Amazon workplaces, and if so, what have been the outcomes? Do you want me to read a few more? Or... Should we, we've got about 15 minutes for questions, maybe because that was two questions in one. Mm. Maybe, Mick, you want to come back immediately on that? Yeah, OK. Uh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, a couple of issues. Uh, we need both. Uh, so, yes, we need enforcement of laws that uh, are already in this country. We have uh, an inspectorate that's uh, uh, radically uh, underfunded, like many public servants uh, uh, to, to, to throughout UK civil society. Uh, it's a question of money. So, uh, in, uh, inspectors and the number of inspectors uh, to access Amazon sites uh, is a problem. The second thing is that uh, we have a system in the UK which was altered around about 15 years ago 
where primary authorities were introduced. So companies like Amazon can actually go to what they call a primary authority who will be responsible for their health and safety throughout the rest of the UK. So Amazon's uh, primary authority uh, is Canuck Chase Council in the West Midland, a very small council, very compliant and, uh, and Canuck uh, along with Amazon made uh, a number of issues to put the giant Rugeley site there in the first place. So do we get a hearing? Uh, are there frequent inspections? Uh, not, not very often, uh, but we have managed to uh, do quite a number of things by freedom of information requests, because we have freedom of information laws, so we can write to the ambulance uh, trusts, we can write to these local authorities and give us their accident statistics and things like that. And funny enough, uh, we did challenge the health and safety executive last year because of a statement that was made by Amazon that was completely untrue about its safety. So, yes, we need existing uh, enforcement toughened up with proper inspectorates. And yes, we also do need proper laws. And, we're, and one of the sad things that we don't have in the UK is the right for unions to organise. And if we had that right to, to organise, then uh, things would be a little bit different for the workers in Amazon today. Great, Mick, thank you. We have, just for people who don't know, we've been calling for workers to have the right to speak to their union on site, inside the workplace, instead of outside being filmed by cameras as is, you know this isn't just amazon we're talking about this is lots of workplaces where that intimidation that regime of fear is in place okay mariella nikki more yeah. questions there's a question specifically for stacy around what prospects she thinks there are of amazon being broken up in the us in a manner akin to the sherman antitrust act and further or alternatively does she see the eu intervening um and then there's another question that's not specifically directed to anyone on the panel. So Francis, you might wanna direct it saying, given the pandemic is seen significant public intervention and large contracts that have benefited big multinationals like McDonald's and Amazon, how do we ensure that support translates into improvements in corporate behavior for workers, communities and the environment when either we all depend on their infrastructure or they can threaten their workforces with dismissal? Great. Um... Stacey, I think you might have an interest in both of those questions and, and then maybe we'll let others chip in. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start in on the first one. Um, I actually, I think the prospects are fairly good that we uh, have a chance of breaking up Amazon and then regulating uh, parts of its business in the public interest. Um, the House report, House of Representatives report coming out of a committee um, last week that uh, Christy and Michelle mentioned, it's really an extraordinary report. Uh, this is, comes on a 15 month investigation that involved millions of documents and hundreds of witness statements, um, very in-depth work by the staff of the committee and bipartisan, the investigation. Uh, the report uh, provides a very comprehensive uh, picture of how Amazon exercises its, its monopoly power um, against both uh, other businesses and against workers um, and offers a, a number of, of policy recommendations leading with, we need to split this company up, that that is a necessary condition uh, and then, or and then, on top of that, we need to provide different kinds of oversight. But if we don't do that restructuring first, um, you know, we're going to really have some. You know, it's going to be difficult to to get where we need to go. Um, this is very uh, sort of an incredible, really incredible. Uh, 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 turn and in, in, in where we are. Um, what's worth noting is that the report came from the majority, which are Democrats, but there was a second report issued by um, several of the, of the Republicans on the committee that largely agrees on the facts and has some disagreement on, on what the policy approaches should be. But I, I, I quote from that report uh, that Amazon's business model is quote, fundamentally anti-competitive. Uh, that's quite a conclusion for a congressional committee 
to, to arrive at and I think suggests that we've, you know, we are uh, in a, at least in a rational world, if we can get there uh, on the path to breaking, to breaking up this company. A couple of other quick points on that. Um, I think part of what's going on, part of what has been driving that is, and you can see in the, in the discussion from everyone on this panel today, is that many different constituencies and entities are reaching the conclusion that you actually have to attack the structure and the power in order to address whatever particular part of the problem that, that they're dealing with, whether it's Amazon's abuse of its workers, whether it's its uh, impact on local economies and, and small and mid-sized businesses, uh, that, the, that the solution really is at the root and that we have to use our, our political power um, really to get there. Um, I think the other reason I will say that there is signs that we, uh, uh, that, that there are decent prospects for actually breaking up this company is the extraordinary amount of energy and time that Jeff Bezos spends focused on Washington, DC. You know, um, there is no company that can really challenge Amazon. So the only threat to its future uh, dominance really comes from DC. And so uh, Bezos has bought the largest private mansion in the city and is now uh, before COVID begun to host these lavish uh, affairs with all sorts of people in power uh, coming there. Um, Amazon is lobbying heavily. It's located its second headquarters outside of Washington, DC. So it will have a whole bunch of people living there, sending their kids to school with the kids of, you know, uh, of people who are part of the government and so on. I mean, this is a push to exercise a uh, certain kind of influence uh, and power to prevent, to prevent that outcome. And then the last thing I'll just say really quickly is that I think heading forward, like how we push this is we're really going to do a lot of work to now marry this sort of analysis of the anti-competitive problems with impacts on the ground, because we need to move members of Congress who are thinking about their districts. And so, uh, you know, this goes to being able to lift up the voices of small business owners, local economies, workers, people, communities that are, that are affected by this. And I, I mentioned that partly because I think I want to you know, add a dimension to something that Tim said about uh, uh, local procurement. And I think the strategy there is not that local governments are going to uh, uh, be able to address Amazon's power, but that, that by pushing at that level, mm -hmm. we actually engage community folks in a conversation about what Amazon's power you know, the impact of Amazon's power that can help then drive a congressional strategy. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, just as a quality check, Tim, can I ask you uh, whether from this Washington house with its wine cellars, and I understand a whiskey cellar, uh, how optimistic are you that we can break up its power? I'm very, I, I, I'm, I agree with Stacey pretty well, word for word. Um, I, I think the, the, the moment is now, particularly uh, if the outcome of the November election goes the way that most of us would like to see. Uh, there is uh, really a chance. And, and one of the things that, you know, as I said earlier, it's not just Amazon. You know, people are really, really mad at Facebook and Google. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not going to uh, present this as a, as, a, as, a, as a struggle against Amazon. We're going to present this as a struggle against the overwhelming and unjustifiable power and influence of, of big business and big tech. Is, is the most obvious example, but there are so many sectors where monopolization is, is, is really taken over and, and are uh, worsening people's experience of the world. Eyeglasses, beer, mattresses, you know, high-speed internet. Um, and, you know, the entire structure of the economy is increasingly dysfunctional. And some of the people who, who are hurt the worst by this are the line workers who should be union represented in all these things. So, so it's not just gonna be an anti-Amazon thing. It's going to be a, let's break up big tech. Great. Um, Mariella, can you remind us of the public sector contract question and whether you've got a one or two more to go around yeah. the panel for everybody to have a go? So the, the public sector one was given in the context of the pandemic that we're seeing public intervention and, and big contracts being given to multinationals. How do we ensure that that support comes with improvements in corporate behaviour for workers, communities and the environment? Um, and then another one that's general for the panel really is until we have political or legislative change, what organizing strategies are working now? Or what okay. strategies? 
Like for example, Christy, what 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 has been observed as being successful now? Okay, should we start with um, Christy on any thoughts on the um, using leverage on the uh, contracts issue, but also the organizing? Okay, so so let me just um, say on the organizing, I think what we've seen uh, in terms of progress on the ground with workers, especially Europe, but also Australia, um, is we've seen that Amazon does respond to uh, strikes, government intervention. I mean, we've seen real actions on the ground, not, not only during COVID, but even pre-COVID, but it's always taken a strike or, or you know, the government forcing Amazon to change. So we saw that during the pandemic where um, the French unions um, brought a, a legal case against Amazon for the pace of work and refusing to and, and allow um, safe safety on the job and, and um, selling products that were not essential so that they wanted them to limit the products to being only essential products. And Amazon lost the case, shut down the warehouse for a month, then appealed the case, lost the appeal, said they were gonna pull out of France I mean, this has happened, you know, where they just pulled out of New York City when when they were confronted with unions and other, uh, you know, NGOs in New York City. They said they were going to pull out, but eventually they reached an agreement with the union and, you know, they eventually pulled back and they eventually did reach an agreement in Italy and in Spain. Um, and in Germany, they haven't been able to get a collective bargaining agreement in Germany, but the workers have been organizing for years. They've got more than, you know, a very sizable uh, membership in the seven warehouses, and they are regularly getting improvements um, and getting some of their demands satisfied. But where there's no legal requirement for Amazon to recognize that union, they're just not going to do it, um, unless perhaps if there's a really long, long strike. So I think in a place like Germany, um, where there's no legal obligation for them to recognize the union, though they'd rather, you know, satisfy some of the economic demands and some of the other demands rather than have to deal with somebody at the a union at the bargaining table. Um, which is to say that it's classic, you know, organizing around workers that issues that workers really care about that they're willing to fight for and they might win on those issues. It just, you know, it's going to take, it takes some legal pressure on Amazon to actually get them to the bargaining table. Um, okay. And we saw some wins in, in Australia as well. They had a big fight over getting hazard pay during the pandemic. Um, they eventually got the hazard pay, but not an agreement, not recognition of the union. Um, so I, okay. you know, it's a mixed bag. Thank you, Christy. Michelle, on that, on that kind of, with the specific context of COVID, where do you see the leverage? Well, I mean, I, in a way, I mean, it's unfortunate because the leverage point was really when a lot of the, um, uh, government money was dispersed. So for right. example, um, in France, they conditioned um, their COVID bailouts on no mo bailout money going to companies that were had activities in tax avoidance. Um, tax havens and so you know we obviously didn't do that in the UK um, but it but I mean I do see that there's going to be ongoing government support so clearly that money should be conditioned on you know tying together some of these requirements so that um, we should be tying a, a government support to providing some of these um, resources to workers. I just wanted to come back on the um, the point around uh, breaking up Amazon and the likelihood of success. I'm really, I agree with um, Stacey and Tim's uh, assessment there, and I'm really heartened to see that, uh, you know, the tides are turning in, in the US. I think it's really important though that um, rest of world and Europe does not kind of get complacent about that, because I think that we can't, rely on US, the US Congress to solve the problem of Amazon in the rest of the world. I think it's actually quite likely that if anything, um, they will carve out. So for example, if they were to break up the US business, they will just break up the US business and that they will basically say, you can do whatever you want in the rest of the world. Um, that's a, that is a possible um, uh, outcome. So we have um, cases against Amazon that are taking place at, at the European level, obviously in the UK, 
we will be in a slightly different position because we'll no longer be under the umbrella of, of whatever remedy is, is negotiated there. So, I mean, the main point is that we need to not take our eye off the ball or assume that somehow that even a breakup, even in the US, that will not solve all the problems. You will still be left with an extremely powerful um, company, even once broken up into those constituent parts. So yeah, I, I know that neither of the panelists was suggesting that that was the entire solution, but I just wanted to highlight that it, we really do need to still move forward on all of these other fronts and especially um, outside of the US. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, sadly, we've got about three minutes left. I want to give last word to Mick uh, because it seems to me this, this is where the action is, how we build workers' power uh, to make all the other strands happen. Uh, you know, so you're not bound by the questions, but just where you see the next steps, what, what you're calling on the rest of us to do. Well, I, I think uh, Christy said something that was actually really very important, which only I think a few people actually realise in the international trade union movement. And that is no single union, no single trade union block or global trade unions can actually be Amazon on their own. Uh, firstly, yeah. there has to be uh, good partners within the global movement uh, coming together with uh, the, the social networks and we also have to replicate that within our own nation countries so for instance GMB is starting to uh, strike up some uh, relationships with uh, good progressive NGOs and, and groups that have a really good social perspective and you know, one of the things that I think we're all not very good at uh, in the trade union movement, we're not always very good at reaching out to the consumers. And, you know, consumers can actually win a lot of these arguments for us uh, in, in a lot of respects. And it's about getting uh, and reaching out to consumers because a lot of consumers have absolutely been ripped off by Amazon in, in a lot of respects. Their data is getting stolen. Amazon has built its power on data, uh, you know, and, it, and it's not just surveillance and all those other techniques. So there's a lot that we can all do. And it's about being broad minded enough. It's about working with a coalition of interested organizations. And through that, uh, through lawmakers and people like that, building that coalition, that actually you can do two things. You either make companies better because you force them to make them better, or that actually people start to develop some sort of social responsibility. And while people are making such huge wealth, some individuals are making such, why would they want to change their behaviours? So, you know, uh, it's in our own, our own hands to do this and uh, organizing on a global scale and replicating those issues in our, our, our own nation countries is the way to build it up that coalition of alliances that will actually either force Amazon to behave better or basically for people to say, sorry, we don't want your products anymore. Thanks very much, Mick. Um, I think that's been a fantastic session. I want to thank all our speakers. I think it really has been an excellent panel. If there are any questions in the chat box left unanswered, I'm sure that um, Nikki and Mariella will gather those and maybe forward them to participants, um, but certainly to make sure that yeah. we're all connected. And just to, you know, big thanks from me. I think the big message from today is that we can challenge Amazon. They may be the mightiest corporation. They may be led by Christy. You're, what do you call him? Bezos. I call him Bezos. <laughs> you know, tomato, tomato. But, you know, the thing is, they're not infallible. They are not invincible. We have organized many, many companies through our history who people thought we'd never win. We'd Thanks. never win. And we have. And I think what's great about this campaign is we've got some great brains working alongside us. We've got some great strategists, some great allies and surprising alliances that 
that cross national borders, uh, that go from the local to the national to the global, I think we're in there. We're in there with a the chance to, to win a better world for working people. Yeah. So thank you everybody uh, today and we will keep in touch and we will stay active. Thank you. Thank you. So nice to be thank with you. you. Thanks, Francis, for organizing Thanks this everybody. and to everybody Great else on the panel. Yes, yeah, well, I too. didn't do anything, of course. It's Nikki and Mariella who've done all the work. <laughs> hey. You've got Perfect. your hands full. You have your hands full. We all do.